Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and uh, welcome to Cyber Scotland Week. Uh, my name is Tim Rollins um, and I'm going to be talking today about the uh, maritime and business resilience. So we're going to cover a range of things, um, but if there is something that you have an interest in in particular, please stick a note in the chat uh, and I'll try and cover it as we go along. Um, <clears throat> very briefly, welcome. Uh, NCC Group, if you haven't come across us before, we are probably the largest cybersecurity company you've never heard of. If you have come across us and you've used us, thank you very much. Uh, and if you would like to hear more from us, then please, again, uh, just make contact uh, and I'll put you in touch with the right sort of people within our organization who are in a position to help you. So I am <clears throat> uh, a director and a senior advisor for NCC Group. Uh, I have a background that uh, spans far too many years now. Uh, of risk and resilience. Um, I really only moved onto the cyber side uh, about uh, five years, six, ooh, six years ago when I joined NCC Group. Um, but before then, I had been very much in the operations uh, risk and resilience areas, uh, including starting out my career working for the government, catching uh, mostly terrorists and spies and the like. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to focus uh, initially on uh, the concepts around the maritime sector. And it's really important to understand that the maritime sector is effectively no different to any of the other sectors, apart from probably being a little bit behind the curve. Now, we can understand why uh, the maritime sector has traditionally operated on razor thin margins. And so um, the investment controlled, obviously, by the, you know, the ship's owners, the ship's operators and the like, um, is generally being pretty poor. And the whole concept around uh, cyber security and cyber resilience, where it really affects the, uh, the maritime and the oil and gas and other sectors. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to focus only on maritime, although I will do to start. Um, it's really key that we understand that these are not explicitly a problem for the maritime sector. They are actually quite wide, quite general. And we see that when um, the same challenges occur to the maritime oil and gas sectors, as we see you know, identified by Gartner and uh, Ponyman, where you know, it really is sophisticated attacks can take place, but actually the commodity attacks, those easy and cheap attacks that anybody can buy off the shelf, anybody can choose to use, um, and I'll talk about those later on, but they are available to target the maritime oil and gas sectors. Um, we've got to understand that it takes a huge amount of time and money to actually deal with these problems. And if you are attacked, you will have problems, I can guarantee you. And I'll, we'll talk about some of the, the challenges that other organizations face. And the impact of regulation has really affected the maritime uh, world quite recently but there is plenty more coming over the horizon. And it's this focus that uh, regulators uh, and, and controlling organizations are placing on the whole concept of resilience, that ability to deliver a business service, whatever that business service happens to be, that is becoming the focus of more and more um, regulators, as I've mentioned, and more and more legislation that's coming through, not just in the UK, but from Europe, from the Americans, uh, and even more, much more widely, that you know, Singapore, Australia, lots of places are focusing on this whole concept of resilience. So, if you haven't been focused on it, as somebody involved in IT security, involved in the, you know, securing your assets, um, resilience has got to be your new byword, um, and in the thinking all the way through. Now, cybersecurity issues are really not new for the maritime sector. Uh, to be honest. There have been reports, if you look at some of these, you know, attacks but dating back to 2015, 2018, 2013, you've been under attack for a long time because you've got what people want. You've got information. You've got the, the sort of thing that the bad guys and girls can monetize. Uh, and time and time again, that's data. But sometimes it's just causing you a vibration factor. Um, in these particular cases, you know, the drugs gangs wanted access to uh, one of the ports, to the operators there, so that they could control which um, shipping containers were being sent in for inspection by customs. And of course, the drug dealers were in making sure their ones that contained the drugs were being skipped around the outside. Bunkering challenges, um, all of these different issues are all related to the whole concept of resilience 
but they are not new. However, the new stuff continues to have an impact. And uh, literally just uh, last year, the IMO itself was hit um, when they suffered an attack. You know, quite a significant one took down their presence for, for some time. Um, you know, the regulator. And even just yesterday, I was having a look around to see what else was current. Um, that vessel, if you uh, don't recognize it, is uh, Putin's uh, private yacht. Um, somebody managed to get into the AIS system, uh, change its designation, change its name effectively, uh, change its location, they put it as drifting, and then uh, bumped it into uh, the piece of Ukraine that the, um, the Russians had just bombed. So we are seeing the pressure on the maritime community. Um, we've certainly seen just, I saw just this morning, um, that there has now been an instruction that Russian ships will not be welcomed into uh, UK ports. So the pressures, um, not just on the industry here, but globally, are going to increase. And because people are taking action, we are likely to see attacks that are not necessarily specifically aimed at these organizations, your organizations, but attacks that are taking place globally, just indiscriminate ones where they leak across into you. And the classic example of that, we just saw, uh, do you remember the um, Irish hospitals? Now the Irish National Health Service effectively was taken down after a single hospital was attacked with ransomware. The spread effect, that knock-on effect, that cascading effect had the influence, uh, had the impact, sorry, uh, across the entire system. So this sort of thing, this specific targeting of maritime and oil and gas communities has been a problem. And the tempo I'll talk about later on has actually increased. And there have been more and more attacks against this sort of industry. Now, the International Maritime Organization did start to wake up to the problem of cybersecurity. And you'll remember that they passed their maritime uh, cyber risk management rule requirements, where in your SMS, you had to add in this whole concept of cybersecurity, risk and resilience. Um, and in order to ensure your document of compliance, for those of you in the maritime community, in order to get your doc, you have to have included cyber risk management into your safety management systems. So it's now law, you won't get your, your doc unless you can demonstrate that you have this in uh, the, the cyber risk management within your SMS. So you've got to be thinking very seriously about cyber, the whole cyber resilience within your fundamental safety plans, because it is a safety issue. And it, 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 there are always going to be that crossover between uh, the cyber security world, the operational resilience world, and safety, particularly maritime oil and gas. You honestly, you can't separate them, uh, and you've got to think of them as a whole. Unfortunately, we continue to see organizations really not getting it right. And we talk about all of these problems actually being a business risk. So your management teams, your senior leadership teams need to get a grip of the whole concept of cyber resilience. And unfortunately, we're still seeing a lack of engagement. We're still seeing people thinking, well, it's cyber, that's an IT issue. We'll let the IT team deal with it. Whereas we've got to move them from this position. We've got to keep them engaged and we've got to keep them thinking that there's far more to cyber resilience than just the technology. And for the technology people, for those of you that are directly responsible, your mindset's got to move on as well from, you know, well, we'll just protect it. We'll build that wall because we know the bad guys and girls just build a big ladder or they tunnel underneath it. They will come constantly searching for new vulnerabilities. So you've got to change your mindset from, from just stopping it from happening to being able to detect it, respond and mitigate with a view of resilience. And I'll keep banging on about resilience because it is so important. This is your ability to deliver your business service. So these are the sorts of issues that you've really got to get your CDN leadership teams thinking about. And you know, if you want, I'll come and talk to them. I do this all the time. I sit down with boards and executives and just try and make this real to them. And if, you, if we can make it real to them, and I literally, I did one of these uh, on Friday and we got to the end of the session and the, the chief exec goes, Tim, now I'm concerned. I thought I understood this. You have just explained it in words of one and two syllables. 
in a way that I hadn't really con contemplated it before. And that's what we need you to do. We need you as the insider, inside your organization to make that change. We've got to get you to push this message and we'll come in and support you and back you up in, in spreading that message as well. So please think about that. One of the problems has been in any business is that they've moved your attack surface. It's actually increased. And the attack surface increased through things like the supply chain and outsourcing. How many of you are actually reliant on another organization for some key bit of your infrastructure, for some key asset that you rely on? Now we know the maritime world, this is, this is a constant problem. You've got a long supply chain of people involved in supporting the kit on board your vessels. It's the same for the oil and gas. You've got people delivering people, you've got people delivering kit. You've got these sort of supply chains. And these supply chains, as I'll talk about in a bit, are vulnerable to that attack. We saw how vulnerable they were to physical disruption with COVID. Now we're seeing how vulnerable again they are to all of the cyber issues. Other challenges, the bring your own device and the internet of things. Well, you know, we've seen an awful lot of organizations, particularly where you've got people on uh, ashore, uh, sorry, uh, offshore, um, where they want additional connectivity. So more and more organizations are having to provide their crews with access to the internet. And this whole issue of uh, letting people get access means that we've seen significant problems on board. We put, a, we put a, a, um, a device on board a vessel in order to study the traffic that was going across its network. And literally within 15 minutes, we were on the phone uh, to our contacts to go, have you got something really unusual going on board your vessel? Because we can see you have three outbound tour connections where it's impossible to see the traffic because it's fully encrypted. You've got um, a laptop on there that is heavily laden with malware because we can see it and we can see it starting to trigger. And you've got somebody actively scanning your network with one of the network scanning tools. And they went, oh yeah, we've got a lot of third party contractors on board. And our response was, well, turn off your guest Wi-Fi, shut down their ability to get onto the internet because you do not know what they're doing. Uh, and until you can start to control that better, you're going to be in a real problem. So um, we've got those as issues. We've got the legacy issue. How many of you are running legacy? I would probably say all of you. Somewhere in your networks, you have got old systems. You have got things that are no longer patched or no longer supported by the operator. And you're not alone. Again, we see this every day. We've just done a, a huge piece of work with an Edinburgh-based finance house who said, oh yes, we've got a decommissioning program for our 2003 servers. And we go, oh, well done. It's only 2022 and you've still got 2003 servers. They were like, yes, yes, we're, 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 we've got a three-year program for decommissioning them. And we went, no, you have got to accelerate your decommissioning process. You were carrying a huge amount of risk with hugely vulnerable systems. And until you can give additional resource and additional focus on getting those off your network, you are gonna be carrying that risk possibly for the next three years. And they looked at their systems and went, you know, yes, you're right. We've got to change our profile. We've got to bring our estate up to date. And that's what they're doing. The other issue around legacy um, is on your control systems. Now we do um, vessel inspections where we look at the technology you've got on board and we are repeatedly seeing single points of failure. A single sensor monitoring something, whether it's a fuel tank, whether it's a cargo, whatever it is, single sensors. And single sensors are vulnerable. Single sensors, if you're trying to update them and if you're trying to patch them and they go wrong, you're left in trouble. So people leave them alone. And this challenge of control systems that are not being updated, again, leaves you vulnerable. And it doesn't matter what your platform is, because you know, at some stage, we're going to discover there is a link between your OT systems, your SCADA, what your control systems, and the outside world. Pretty much every vessel we've gone on, we've seen somewhere there is that connection. And it may not affect you whilst you're at sea. It may not affect your offshore platform until that connection is made, until you get increased connectivity. 
So, you know, those issues of uh, legacy kip, single points of failure are leaving you very vulnerable. And then certainly not giving you that resilience that uh, we're looking for. And then the other challenge is if you're not using legacy stuff, for which case, congratulations, then you're using the cloud. And we have seen organizations go, well, we've just got to get into the cloud. We've got to get start sharing stuff. And you go, that's fine. But have you thought about the governance and control that you've wrapped around that use of the cloud? Have you really looked at making sure that you're monitoring the cloud? Because the cloud providers have this habit of what we call evergreen. They're constantly tweaking. They're constantly adding things because they want to improve the service. But as they add them, they don't necessarily maintain the security levels that you might need. Suddenly something that defaulted to on now defaults to off. And so if you're not constantly monitoring your cloud configuration, you may think, well, I'm safe. I've, I've outsourced it, we're, we're fine. That's brilliant, but you need to be thinking about securing it as you go along. So it's a constant thing. Um, you can't afford to ignore your cloud. Um, uh, Liam suggest, uh, put a question up saying, to what degree does the IMO requirements expectations capture or determine what level of supply chain due diligence is expected? It's an interesting question. And I don't think it's fully defined, but you are expected to be able to provide good safety and good cybersecurity. So even if it's not defined by the IMO uh, in explicit words, look at some of the uh, policies, look at some of the frameworks and see how they define cybersecurity. And curiously enough, my next slide is around this one. So the IMO regulations are based on NIST uh, and not by accident. We were actually part of the group that was looking at the IMO regulations we actually were campaigning to ensure that the IMO used NIST, the American Standards Organization, um, rather than trying to invent their own, because we can put this framework forward that is widely understood and widely measured and actually makes far more sense than trying to come up with something fresh and new. Um, so the use of the NIST was really a good framework and it sets out and controls. And you can measure yourself against the NIST framework, or you can get us to come in and do it for you. And that ability to use that framework is, is embedded within um, the IMO regulations. And we expect that the IMO, uh, sorry, the, uh, the flag states who are the um, flag organizations that are looking at your safety management systems will expect you to be uh, building them according to NIST controls. And if you can demonstrate that you've got good NIST controls, you will meet the requirements. And you know, supply chain is mentioned in those. And it really, going back to the point I was making just a moment ago around um, uh, the cloud, it doesn't matter where your data is. You can outsource the resource, i.e. use the cloud, use somebody else's computers. You can't outsource the risk that risk will stay with you. Now, unfortunately, when we do measure organizations against uh, NIST, we regularly find them lacking. So we, we did a review of the energy and utility sectors. So these are um, firms that we have brought us in and asked us to assess them against NIST. And NIST operates on a one to five scale across identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And you can see that, unfortunately, the energy and the utility sector doesn't perform well, which suggests that you're well behind the curve when it comes to you know, measuring yourself against the global average. That global average was from over 120 cybersecurity reviews that we've done um, in the last three years. So we do cybersecurity reviews very regularly. Um, we wanted to ensure that we, we were using our data because then we control it, we know the standard that it's being checked to. And we found that really people are lacking. People are not doing as well as they thought they were doing, and they're not doing as well as they need to. 
So that whole issue of resilience is still at, at lacking. So let's talk about resilience a bit more. And I would, uh, you, you know me now, by now I'll bang on about it. Um, it is both a requirement and a business opportunity. And I mentioned the business opportunity side because we are now seeing uh, con um, supply chains where you may be supplying somebody else are starting to go, what are your resilience options? How resilient are you? What are you doing? Have you got your software in escrow? Have you had a cybersecurity review? Can you demonstrate to us uh, buying a service, a product or anything else from you? Can you demonstrate that you're a resilient organization? So it is a business opportunity. And certainly um, we wouldn't expect anybody to be chartering or hiring a vessel that can't now demonstrate that it's got cybersecurity written into its SMS. So, the ministerial guidance on resilience, um, just to go to, uh, here in the UK, this was Kwasi Kwarteng, the business secretary. They are saying you need to improve your resilience. He's saying this is across the board. This isn't something that's just uh, the public sector is going to be doing it, but the public and the private sector needs to be doing it. You've got to consider resilience as you invest, and you've got to look at reducing the risk of security compromise. Now. The security problem isn't going to go away at the moment. Everybody is on heightened alert with the Russia-Ukraine situation. So this is a problem that is very current uh, right now. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but you know the, the concept of resilience that the government's looking to try and ensure is that dark blue bit at the bottom, a more resilient critical national infrastructure. And transport, oil and gas, you're in that CNI critical national infrastructure. They want to make public sector more resilient, businesses, and then everybody reducing the burdens. But you've got to look at how um, you can make it easy to do the right thing. And that's what he talks about, that reducing the burden. If we can defend the UK at a national level, working at the infrastructure level, at the, the ISPs, uh, the companies that carry the, the weight of traffic across the internet, all of those people, we can work at that level and, and keep the bad guys and girls out, that's gonna help. Um, but the pressure will come all the way down to that center where you're sitting, that dark blue bit, you are the critical part of that critical national infrastructure. And that's where the focus is gonna be because we have seen with COVID a classic example whereby not having a resilient organization, not having a resilient supply chain has led to significant problems. So talking of, of you know, the government involvement, this is just a quick look at what's coming over the horizon. These uh, are all issues that we as an organization, as NCC group, we're looking to go, okay, what, what's, what's the government doing? And not just the UK government, the US and the Europeans, um, you know, what are they looking at? Where are they going? What's going to be something that we need to be up and understanding so that we can help you, our clients? Um, and we're focused right the way across the board. Everything from, you know, on here, the Bank of England, Bayes, where Kwesi Kroteng, uh, the minister is from, um, you know, transport, the, the central bank uh, digital currency concept. All of these are different ideas of where they are looking initially at guidelines and then there will be regulation. And this move to regulation, you know, I know that the you know, conservative government would traditionally say, oh, we're the party of small, um, small government. We don't like too many laws. We'll take away some of the European laws. Yes, they may well do that. But actually, they have understood that in order to defend the wider community, to defend the people at the end, they need those critical national infrastructure sectors to be well defended. And therefore, putting regulation on you is the way to do it. So it's coming over the hill no matter what you want. Um, and this focus is always going to be on operational resilience. Um, these are some of my favorite quotes on operational resilience. Um, that's von Mott the Elder, which is uh, generally read as um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, but actually, that's what he said. Um, Churchill. Plans are of little importance. Planning is essential. And everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. So these are just for you to think about. Yes, 
please get your plans in place to be a more resilient organization. And again, we can help with policies and procedures and we can do the investigation, whatever it is that you need to do this and work with you to drive operational resilience into your organization. But you've got to have a plan because you've got to have thought about it. That's what Churchill was talking about when he said plans are a little important. Planning is essential. You've got to have done the thinking and you want to have done the thinking before anything happens. Because that's the time when you can start to put the resources, the contacts, the, 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 the connections that you need in order to provide a resilient organization in place. And we talk to, to boards, we talk to individuals all the time about what you can do to improve your resilience. Select, train, and manage your people. Absolutely, we need to do this. Um, you know, we need good people, and we need them to be focused on the challenge. And we need to keep reminding those people for whom this isn't the day job, which is, to be frank, is going to be most people in your organization. We still need them to be aware. So please, please, please think about that training and managing. And the managing is key because when we I'll talk about the threats and where that comes from, the insider threat, the individual who goes rogue generally is badly managed. I did a review once of over 300 insider cases <clears throat> and the common feature for, for them was that they were pissed off with their management. So think about how you manage people because most people don't join an organization with a plan to go rogue. Uh, the last study I saw from CPNI was about, you know, of all of the cases they looked at, about 6%. The overwhelming majority of cases were people who were inside an organization who then went bad in some way, shape or form. So there's that. <clears throat> Ensuring the governance. I know it's not the most exciting thing. Nobody likes having to have a committee or an organization or a group that is responsible for, you know, overseeing and supervising. But actually, unless you have that tone from the top, unless you have that buy in by the senior management with an individual in the senior leadership team who is committed and identified as being responsible, and then it gives that time and effort into ensuring that the governance and procedures and the policies are in place to defend your data and your systems, your critical systems on board the ship, on board the platform, in the process, wherever they are. If you can't identify the person that is responsible for that, or is, is actually in the race, well, you know, accountable for that, then you're in problems. We talked about you know, managing, detecting, and responding. We can't afford to leave your systems vulnerable. Please, please, please look at getting the process in place the technology in place that enables you to manage, detect, and respond. Because again, trying to introduce it after the event is more expensive, it's more time consuming, and it's a real pain for everybody's sake. So it's that resilience, designing, testing, design, train, and test. Um, and the testing does need to be, I'm, tomorrow morning, I've got a two hour session with an IT and corporate uh, communications, legal, uh, IT services, we're getting together for a two hour exercise to focus on how they would respond, to check that their plans work. So it's actually testing it to make sure it's better. If you have not done a test, then you're really not ready. If you haven't actually taken your offline backups, and you are doing offline backups, aren't you? If you haven't taken your offline backups and rebuilt them in a fresh environment, you haven't tested. If you haven't got the people together and sat down and worked with them through a crisis exercise where they can understand the pressure they're going to be under, then you haven't prepared properly. So, you know, why should you be concerned? You know, the fines, the business disruption, the loss of trust. Well, we've looked at the problem. <clears throat> it, re it is real. I've just reviewed, you know, 10 different uh, commercial threat intelligence reports just to try and get a flavor for what's happening and what's out there, you know, and rather than just relying on our own, we produce a, you know, a, a monthly, annual, monthly and annual uh, threat reports. But I went far wider than this. We looked at 10 different ones to try and identify some of those key issues that are out there. And the problems that all of them are seeing are very similar. There are active adversaries. 
people are deliberately trying to get into your networks and systems. This isn't just an automated process, although a lot of it is. A lot of it, again, is going to be internet based. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems at the moment, particularly with the uh, Ukraine situation, is we're seeing a massive uptick of spear phishing, targeted emails against individuals uh, in order to try and compromise those systems. But there is a constant drive to attack. Um, <clears throat> we asked, you know, a, a big survey. So that was, um, I think that was 1,300 people. CISOs were asked uh, by Imperva, you know, another, another <clears throat> excuse me, another company. We said, okay, so what are you seeing? What are you actually seeing as a CISO? Phishing and malware attacks on the increase, you know, 39%. So small increase or some increase and you know 21 percent seeing a significant increase so they're going on operational technology supply chain all of these things i've talked about uh, and we'll focus on ransomware in a minute because ransomware unfortunately is still going to be one of those biggest problems now we did uh, our own uh, review of all of the activities that we were involved in last year and you can just see there the attack type of ransomware is well out of well ahead of anything else and if you have a look at that chart on the on the side the orange bars that orange bar at the top you may not be able to read the writing but it says exploited publicly facing um, application so this is where the bad guys and girls have got in they've targeted something that is connected to the internet and whilst your vessels are increasing their connectivity you're increasing your attack surface while your platforms uh, while your products, your refineries, whatever, wherever you are involved in the situation, this is the problem. You are being attacked over the internet. You are being attacked. Even if you've got air gap systems or you believe you've got air gap systems, we are seeing people compromise those. Um, uh, and it is a con constant problem. And the problem really has got worse. Um, just to have a look at this, this is a... Um, it's not coming up for some reason. Sorry, I don't know what's happening with my system. It's gone slow. Uh, sorry, I've got a pop up box has um, starting to cause trouble for me. Um, maybe I'm being hacked. This is a, a, an indication of some of the challenges that we have identified again um, within industrial systems and industrial control systems. And actually, as you move to that right hand side, there has been an increase in the targeting and the disruption of systems that are in that area. It's not just the IT, it's the IT and the OT. It's not necessarily that the OT is being targeted directly, although that is on the increase, but we're seeing situations where IT, having been ransomed, where has had a significant impact on the business's ability to deliver its services. Classic example here, it's, it's on that list, but you know, think about the colonial pipeline attack. That was not targeted at the OT, it was the IT that was taken down. They were unable to figure out who was gonna pay for all of the fuel that they were pumping through their pipeline. So they had to turn it off from their point of view. So there is that problem started with the IT community, had a significant impact on the OT community. And the, the problem, you know, again, it probably wasn't really focused on colonial pipeline as a as a, a part of the critical national infrastructure for the US. And certainly when the organization that provided the ransomware, because they were operating it as ransomware as a service, when they found themselves on the receiving end of an awful lot of attention, they said they would be taking more uh, interest in who their affiliates were targeting and would not let them target particular sectors because of the problems that it brought. Suddenly they had uh, the whole of the US uh, intelligence and law enforcement community focused on them, uh, not something that they fancied uh, having to deal with. So if we think around that ransomware problem, you know, there's, there's the question of, you know, well, what needs protecting? What have we got? I dealt with a case two weeks ago where the CEO for Europe said, why would they target us? We haven't got anything of interest. And by the time I'd sat him down and talked him through everything that he did have, 
the, you can see the light slowly glimmering and slowly coming on. And, and yes, he acknowledged that he did have some things that were uh, of value to other people. But the fact that he hadn't focused on it before has cost him dear. He's had to pay for um, all of his IT to be rebuilt. He's had to pay for the forensic investigation. He's having to pay for uh, credit monitoring of all of his staff, current and former, because they hold a lot of data around their former staff. Um, this has really bitten him badly because he hadn't bothered to put the focus in beforehand. Now he's having to deal with it. There is a lot of data there. Um, and underpinning that is you know, your personal and your organization's reputation. This really is something you do not want to be associated with you know, a bad ransomware attack. Uh, we quite often see a CEO, a CIO, and others leaving an organization within 18 months of a major incident um, because it sits with them. You know, Dido Harding is always going to be known as that woman who had the major cyber attack, didn't know whether her data was encrypted and sat in front of a huge old cathode ray tube uh, screen um, when they were supposed to be a high tech uh, comms company. You know, really not a good image. She's managed to pull it through. She's managed to get her um, uh, a bit of a reputation back. But underpinning all of that is the shareholder value, that stakeholder value, which is wider than just shareholders. It's the other people that are invested in your organization that also need that protection that you can provide. And you're protecting it against a wide range of organizations. Now, you, know, you never know when you're going to come to the attention of activists and hobbyists. Um, when I mentioned Dido, uh, you know, the attack on, which was actually on a Tiscali website, do you remember that? Um, the exploit that was used by the hobbyist, he was a, a young kid, actually he was 16, and the exploit he used was older than he was. So, you know, something that uh, basically Talk Talk had forgotten about this Tiscali website, but it was still there and still connected, and he managed to get into the back end of it. So. The hobbyist is still going to be a problem. Um, the activists, you never know when you're going to come to the focus of the activists. When I worked for a very large, very dull Swiss bank, um, uh, actually just after I had left, they suddenly came to the attention of some act an activist group because of some of the work that they were funding. Uh, it was an oil pipeline uh, an organization took against them. They had people sleeping in the air conditioning unit of uh, the large building that they were using for their annual general meeting. They slept in there for three days before the AGM, weren't spotted in the sweep because they were literally hiding in the air conditioning ducts, um, and then uh, abseiled out of those spaces into the annual general meeting, causing a massive amount of disruption. Now, you know, the bank at the time was lucky that they were just doing this in person and hadn't launched a uh, activist cyber-based attack against them, but they certainly do happen. Of these, the, the, the ones that we really need to focus on are probably the financially mot motivated criminals. They're the ones who are looking to make money out of you. Um, the journalists probably not that interested until your data leaks, and then they will rake over it and do what they can in order to find it. And we've seen a number of organizations where, you know, the financial journalists in particular, where there's been money, the Panama Papers, for example, where they may not be interested to start with, they may not do the hacking themselves, but once they've been given it, they will make hay. Um, the nation states, always going to be a problem. And at the moment, the nation state threat has obviously increased. We haven't identified clear attacks um, outside of the Ukraine environment or Ukraine and Belarus. Um, but the problem that we're expecting there is that, that leak. So organizations that may have a footprint in Ukraine and Belarus may end up um, being targeted in those locations and that having an impact back on the wider organization. The insiders I've talked about may not join, but badly managed people end up uh, working for baddies or doing it themselves. And we see them exfiltrating data and we see them being offered money to allow people in. So we have you know, access brokers who are actively offering cash to get, allow access to organizations. And we've seen people running ransomware where the ransomware note says, by the way, you've read this, but if you wanna give us access, we'll pay you a cut of whatever money we make. And we let them in time and time again in the same ways with removable media. Those of you that have got you know, rigs and, um, and vessels, 
uh, vessels in particular, we constantly see people taking USB sticks in going, oh, you know, the pilot arriving, going, oh, you need to print this out. And the only way you can do it is by sticking that USB stick into uh, the system and, and letting it process without any great knowledge of what's on that USB stick. So we're letting people in. The fishing I've talked about and how there's been a significant increase in spear fishing at the moment. Um, social engineering is that talking your way in. How many of you, I certainly have, sat at home, the phone rings, and somebody's claiming to be a BT engineer or a Microsoft engineer and um, saying that there's a problem on your system. This really does happen all of the time. Um, and in a talking your way into a system, socially engineering your way, getting persuading somebody to do something, um, often in um, tied up with uh, the spear phishing or the phishing. So if you get hit with two things that look to be tied together, um, it's far harder to resist. Poor passwords are a constant problem. If I have one wish that you take away today is please go and look at the passwords that give your supply chain access to your network. We've literally just been working on a, uh, a compromise where a supplier had access to the system and was using a three character password. It's just ridiculous, but it had been set up and installed years ago. Nobody had thought about it since, but they continued to have access using that. We've just done another case where um, they were compromised over their own VPN through a supplier's account, again, with a, and this time, a six character password, which had uppercase and lowercase and, you know, special characters, all the rest of it. That really is not good enough. So the poor passwords are continuing to let people into systems. If you haven't put uh, a review through of your passwords, please, please, please do that. Um, we run cracking programs against passwords in order to have a look at just how good they are. And they're ridiculously weak. So change your policy. Stop forcing people to change their password every 90 days. Go for longer, more complex, as the National Cybersecurity Center advises. Those three random words are a much better situation because you've got to do something to try and tie up uh, your systems. The technical vulnerabilities uh, I've mentioned when we talk about particularly around the legacy side. The supply chain I've, I've talked about uh, as the physical access, this is still a problem. I, it's going to become more of a problem as people start to um, go back into the office where getting physical access to systems is, uh, is more easily um, to take. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, they make the money. How are they making the money in order to do it? Well, of these, you know, to be honest, the changing bank account details, the business email compromise, where they can uh, change a number, they can change, uh, get into an email chain and change things so money gets diverted to different bank accounts is still one of the biggest financial hits. Um, the ransomware is probably uh, the most disruptive of those. But there is a lot of this activity going on and they really do make their money. Um, even if you take this from uh, Grand Crab, one of the, the uh, organized crime groups, they talk about having made $2 billion. Now, even if you take that with a pinch of salt, because they're trying to attract new people to support them, um, even if you take it with that pinch of salt, <clears throat> this is still a significant money-making factor. So, you know, they will try, they will spend the money to get that access. They will spend the money to get into your system, buy vulnerabilities, buy access to your system because they're making money out of it. And the way they're running ransomware has changed. Traditionally, one system was locked up uh, with an automated ransomware. It scanned your system. You clicked on something. You logged in. Uh, whatever it was, you gave access to your system. It was automatic ransomware. Over the years, that has transitioned to human-operated ransomware, where they will spend longer time in your system, establishing that remote command and control, moving across the network, escalating their privileges to become a domain administrator, you know, exploiting a vulnerability past the hash, getting hold of the Kerberos ticket, whatever they do in order to uh, elevate their privileges. We are seeing them uh, steal the data as well. So they're, they're, you know, they're, what's they're now calling the double extortion, where they'll ransom your system, steal the data, 
And now the triple extortion is once they run the ransomware stuff is they then start DDoSing you uh, with a denial of service attack. All of this putting the problem on. And if your backups are not offline, compromising your backups as well. So we have seen them get into systems and deliberately turn off uh, the scheduling process such that you don't have backups. You think that they're going ahead, but they're not, um, or they are uh, corrupting the backups in its staging post, and then it gets loaded into your system uh, as a corrupted backup. So this is a problem and it's getting worse. It really will have a problem, you know, it will give you a bad day. When you start seeing this on your screens, uh, you and your teams are going to have a bad day managing it. And as we talked about, this really is that wider problem. It's not just your network. They will put pressure on you by calling your staff. We literally were getting um, uh, WhatsApp messages coming into one of the companies that we were working with last week, uh, where the bad guys, having stolen the data, were saying, why isn't your company negotiating with us? You need to get hold of them. You need to put the pressure on them, because otherwise your data is going to be leaked. And that sort of real personal pressure, um, because they've gone through the data set, they've found people's telephone numbers, and they're sending the messages. Um, we know that they can do automated messaging. So we're seeing uh, voicemails being left on corporate systems. Uh, we're seeing that denial of service attacks taking place. All of this is designed to put the pressure on you to respond and react. If you haven't taken that firm decision as to whether or not you're going to pay, uh, generally, we'd say that's an ethical question, i.e., are you happy to fund organized crime groups? Um, there's the existential question, which is you, you might go, no, I'm not going to pay. And then the existential question is, well, actually, the entire organization will fold if we don't pay and try and get something back because they have corrupted our backups. They have destroyed our systems. So it's an existential question. And then you might have the exception. The exceptional issue is, well, we wanted to pay in order to try and get it back, but actually the organization we're trying to pay is a sanctioned organization. Now, um, sanctions traditionally were against you know, governments and uh, government organizations, but the US in particular has started to sanction organized crime groups and money exchanges. So actually paying these can, can be against the law. So what are you gonna do? because this really does require you to you know, provide that focus to think about how you are going to become a more resilient organization. Um, it's this question of when, not if. And if you go back to those numbers, you know, over 70% of UK firms have had a, uh, an attack. That's you know, coming from the systems, coming from the, uh, the organizations that do this response. Uh, you know, it's an extrapolation, of course it is. Um, you can't uh, go around and interview everybody, but it looks like in some way, and that may be as anything as innocently as having been hit with uh, phishing emails all the way through to a full-blown attack. So this is real, and we need you to understand that it's a constant problem. And please, 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 don't just put this on the back burner. Don't walk away. Hope is not a strategy. I hope we're going to be okay because is really not a strategy. You need to make a plan for resilience. You need to be thinking about your backups. You need to be thinking about the training that you're giving to your people. You need to be thinking about your cyber hygiene, making sure that you are prepared, that your systems are updated, that they're patched. This is all good stuff that the National Cyber Security Center has been banging on about for the, since it was set up uh, and before. You know, honestly, Getting your cyber hygiene right will make a significant difference. Ensuring that your OT is isolated, is protected, that you've tested it. Please don't be that, that vessel, don't be that platform where we come aboard and find that somebody has connected two systems together and your OT is now fully exposed onto the internet because there are people actively scanning for it, looking for it, and they will target it if they can because some of it will be fully automated getting that initial access might be, and then they'll hand it over, they'll sell it on. You know, for initial access brokers, it takes about two or three days before they can find a buyer for your information. That's all it takes. Somebody will be interested in it and somebody will want to buy it. 
So resilience is the, is the idea. What are you going to do differently tomorrow? You know, you've had this warning. I've talked to you through. I hope you found it uh, at least interesting or, or thought provoking. Um, if you want to get in touch, please do. Um, talk to anybody from NCC Group. Pop us an email, drop us a line, give us a call, whatever it takes. Um, but think about how you're going to make a change because you don't want to be in that situation of dealing with a ransomware. You don't really want to be having to call us and going, yeah, we listened to Tim, but we didn't do anything that he suggested. So and now we need your, your help to come in and help sort us out because we're in the middle of a crisis. We'll do it. Of course we will. You know, we have a fabulous cyber incident response team. They are constantly busy. And I'll provide that additional support and guidance to your board, to your executive, to your senior leadership team, helping them understand the pain that they're about to go through in dealing with the crisis. But far better if you can get ahead of the game, if you can exercise and train them ahead of the game, if you can work with them to make them acknowledge that cyber resilience is here, it needs to be part of their business risks and they need to be thinking about it. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna give you a few minutes back in your diary. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. If you do have any questions or queries, please either drop them in the uh, chat or we will see you another time. Thank you very much. Take care.